Okay. So technically, biochemistry, water is part of biochemistry. Um, this particular chapter is specifically about organic biochemistry. We're going to be talking about compounds and living things that contain carbon, uh, carbohydrates, pro proteins, lipids, nucleic acids. But technically, water is also part of, of biochemistry because water is like 70% of our body. So it's a big part of biochemistry. The test on this next week, by the way, Thursday, there won't be specific questions about the basic chemistry lecture that you're supposed to go fill in. That's review stuff. The questions will be about the water lecture and about biochemistry. The only thing is, remember that it's expected when I say, oh, water has polar covalent bonds, you know what that means, which means you may need to go back and refer to the, bio, the basic chemistry information, uh, make sure you know what electronegativity is, things like that. Whatever applies to what we're talking about, you're responsible for. So biochemistry is basically going to be organic compounds in this particular section. And organic basically just means it contains carbon. In the case of all the compounds we're going to talk about, they actually all contain both carbon and hydrogen both. And the word organic literally translates from life, because originally they thought that these were compounds that were only found in living things. We now know that's not the case. Um, in fact, when you study organic chemistry, you really don't necessarily talk about living things at all. Um, you learn about different groups that form all kinds of compounds like um, acetone and formaldehyde and alcohols and ketones and waxes and um, plastics and stuff like that. But our focus is going to be on specific organic compounds that are important to living things. So the backbone of an organic compound is basically called a hydrocarbon. And just like it sounds like, a hydrocarbon is nothing more than just hydrogen and carbon. In fact, the simplest organic compound, if we were to look at just the base for all of this, would be uh, methane, which you don't have to memorize, by the way. You don't have to know that methane is the simplest. But methane is nothing more than a carbon surrounded by hydrogens. And based on this, how many bonds can a carbon make? Four. Carbon's sort of right in the middle. If you remember that some atoms want to gain electrons and some want to lose electrons to get eight, well, carbon has exactly four. It's not going to be very easy to get rid of four or to gain four to make eight. So carbon is going to be a, an excellent example of something that's always going to share electrons. It's going to form covalent compounds and share with other things because it's very difficult to steal four and it's also very difficult for something to get rid of four. These are just some other examples of hydrocarbons. Again, you do not have to know any of these examples. Um, ethane, propane, butane. Propane's like what is in your propane tank when you grill. Um, butane's in butane lighters. Not that you smoke, but butane lighters. Um, so, and these are nothing more than long carbon chains. What this really looks like would be butane would just look like this. It would just be a long chain of hydrogen and carbon. Every carbon would have four things attached to it, and in this case, it's all just hydrogens. So you don't have to know these particular compounds. Just understand that that's what a hydrocarbon is. It's just a long chain of carbons. Now, for the purposes of what we're going to be talking about, for living things, biochemistry, the most important thing that's going to happen here is that these chains of carbon are going to have special connections to them called functional groups. And depending on the functional groups, that's what's going to determine the job of that particular hydrocarbon. So for example, certain functional groups are going to make it a lipid, and it's going to behave as an oil, or a fat, or a wax, or a steroid. Other functional groups are going to make it a carbohydrate, so it's going to behave as a sugar, or a starch, um, a polysaccharide, a monosaccharide. Other functional groups make it a protein. Correct. I'm going to show you, in fact, on the next slide is actually all the functional groups that you need to know. Um, my suggestion to you, because I will post this lecture on Edline eventually, but my suggestion to you would be to just take a snapshot of, of these after I put them all up. It's just a single slide, but when they're all up, take a snapshot and maybe try making some flashcards. People complain that biochem is the hardest chapter. You may have heard that from people from last year. You say biochem and you'll see by their faces that they, they did not like this chapter. And the main reason why is because this chapter requires a lot of memorization of, of how these organic compounds look. And so the functional groups, which I'm going to show you on this slide, 
Um, I would just recommend after they're all up, take a snapshot and start learning them. Don't wait till the last minute and then try to learn 10 functional groups because um, it's going to be hard to do if you wait until the last minute. Every single one of these we're going to be talking about in detail starting tomorrow when we get into proteins and lipids and you know, you'll see, well, why is a hydroxyl important? Where is an alcohol gonna be? Well, when we talk about triglycerides, fats, you're gonna see something called a glycerol, which includes an alcohol group. So this is an easy one, hydroxyl. If you remember learning polyatomics in chemistry, you probably remember hydroxyl, the OH. Phosphate's another one that you may have learned in chemistry as PO4 with a negative three charge, the polyatomic. I don't know if you remember what I'm talking about when I say polyatomic. You had to crisscross to get the formulas, you know, ammonium nitrate and, you know, nitrogen, or well, that would be one. Anyway, so that's phosphate. Phosphate's important in ATP, for example. In fact, it's the most important part of ATP. What does ATP stand for? Do you remember? Adenosine triphosphate. Three phosphates, and the phosphates are the most important part of ATP. So that's why you need to recognize what a phosphate is. This is called an amine or an amino group. Um, this R is not an element. R just represents whatever it's attached to, sort of like how you use X in algebra as a variable. So in other words, the actual amine or an amino group is this, the NHH. And then it would be connected to something. But this would be called the amino group. I'm pretty sure you've heard of an amino acid. Amino acids, you hear them talk about it on TV. Amino acids are the building, building blocks of protein. Why are they called amino acids? Because every one of them has an amino group on it. That's where the name amino acid comes from. So that's, that's why we're learning about the amino group. The next one is called an ester. Uh, when we talk about DNA and RNA, you're gonna see esters. Again, the R just represents that it could be anything in that spot. The ester group itself is the carbon double bonded to oxygen and then bonded to another oxygen here. The most important place you're gonna see this is when we see the, the ladder of the double helix of DNA. The, the different nucleotides are connected by what are called phosphodiester bonds. And obviously an ester is this. What do you think the phospho refers to? It's already up here. Phosphate. It's gonna be a phosphate connected to one of these. Aldehyde and ketone, this is actually in the pre-lab. When you work on the pre-lab today, you'll see this. They're gonna show you a, draw, a diagram, and they're gonna ask you to circle the aldehyde in the diagram. Aldehyde and ketone are actually both almost the same thing. Um, it's a carbon double bonded to oxygen, right here. The thing is, if the carbon double bonded to oxygen is in the middle of something, and then you've got these chains on the two sides, it's a ketone. If the carbon double bonded to oxygen is on the end, so it's going to be a carbon double bonded to oxygen and then a little hydrogen right here. Now it's called an aldehyde. So it's really the carbon double bonded to oxygen that, that's important. If it's in the middle, it's a ketone. If it's on the end, it's an aldehyde. Yes? So we need to know how like, each of these like, look? Basically, you're going to need to know how they look. What I would probably not do is give you five of these and say which of these is an aldehyde. But if I drew for you, for example, this is a... This is the drawing of an amino acid. <coughs> so let's say I gave you a drawing of this and I said which of the which part of this would be an amino group? I would expect that you would know, oh, okay, that's the amino group that makes it an amino acid because you know what an amino is. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So there's gonna be an application of it. Um, but not necessarily a question where I'm just going to say which of these is pointing to a phosphate. Although phosphate's a really easy one, I would think you would know that one. Uh, this is called a thiol or a sulfhydryl group. This is actually going to be really important when we talk about how proteins fold up. If you remember learning about enzymes maybe and how they have this active site and they speed up reactions, I don't know if you remember ever learning about that, but what gives them their specific shape are these sulfhydryl groups. And the last one is called a carboxyl group or a carboxylic acid group. This is actually the other part of an amino acid. If I redraw for you, and that's the last one, by the way, and then you can take a snapshot. If I redraw for you an, a, a typical amino acid, it's gonna have a group here, a group here. Here's your carboxyl or carboxylic acid group on this side, and here's your amino group on this side. So why is it called an amino acid? Because all amino acids have an amino group 
and a carboxylic acid group, and so it's called an amino acid. Every amino acid looks just like that. Yes? Yes, that's and that's the thing that makes it different from an aldehyde. Because an aldehyde is just a C double bond and an O and then just an H here. This one's always C O O H. In fact, if they don't have unfortunately I know in like flashcard let you can't put drawings, which would be nice because these are all drawn out structurally. But sometimes you can see it written just like this. Just as a C O O H. That's another way it's written. If you because then that way it's not showing you the structure, it's just showing you what elements are in it. Correct. This would be somewhere, so you'd have like some kind of a chain, and then this, and then some other stuff. And here it's going to be on the end. You'll have a bunch of stuff, but then on the very end you'll have this sticking there. Yes? So you think we should um, get flashcards and draw like that drawing? I mean, that would be my yeah, recommendation, because you definitely need to know, you will need to know these, every single one of these, because there's more like 15 or more functional groups, probably. But these are the specific ones that you need to know as far as the organic stuff we're going to talk about. You'll never have to know a lot of the other groups, so I didn't go through them. So that's where we're stopping. You have almost 30 minutes to work on the pre-lab. Um, the biochemistry lab, you'll see it under labs. There's a whole pre-lab reading. Most of the answers to the pre-lab questions, you can find right there in that reading at the top. And then when you scroll down, you'll, you'll scroll down, you'll see the procedures. Keep scrolling down, you'll see the pre-lab questions. So you can work on that today. That's what's due Friday. You can answer most of them just from the reading. A couple of them you may have to look up. Um, but by tomorrow, we will have covered everything that's that's there, just so you know. This. So yesterday, we talked about how to um, how to name the functional groups. And I told you that you're, you're going to see that we're going to be using each of those different functional groups as we go through the organic compounds of life. So today, um, the first thing I want to go over with you is how do we put these things together? So the, the base organic uh, compound that everything kind of starts from will be just this carbon chain. And the little bitty pieces of the carbon chain are, are called monomers, mono for one. So what do you think we call it when we put a long chain together? Polymers. So the idea is that every uh, different one that we're going to talk about, carbohydrates, lipids, proteins, nucleic acids, they all have basic building blocks. The building blocks of a protein are, are the monomers of the protein. In the case of protein, the monomers are amino acids. In sugars, the, um, the monomers are the monosaccharides. And then we build them into more complicated things. So each different class of compounds has its own monomers. When we put them together, we form polymers or chains, which then fold up and have specific shapes and have specific jobs. So this was a question in the pre-lab a lot of people asked me about yesterday, about what is it, uh, what, how do you draw a synthesis reaction? And actually it's called a dehydration synthesis reaction. What does it mean if you get dehydrated? Your body water. Right, your body like doesn't have enough water. Like maybe you sweat too much, you haven't drank enough. So the name of the, of the reaction that puts these monomers together is actually called a dehydration synthesis reaction. And the reason why, if we look at it, is that you're going to have something, and in the lab you may have drawn it more complicated than this, but you have something that has, let's just say it has an OH sticking off of it, and then you have some other thing that also has an OH sticking off of it. And what basically ends up happening in a dehydration synthesis reaction is that the H from one of these and the OH from the other are going to combine and leave as water. And what's going to be left will be this and this now chained together. So it's called a dehydration synthesis because this sort of becomes dehydrated. It loses water in order to hook together. Now in your notes you're going to see one there that's more complicated looking. It's got these um, hexagon shapes and shows like an OH here and an OH here. It's basically it's the same thing. It could be any two things. It could be two amino acids, two fatty acids. It could be anything hooking together. It's always going to work the same way. It's going to be the H from one, the OH from the other. Those are going to get together and then this is going to end up being a bond between the two. So that's a dehydration synthesis reaction or a condensation reaction. The opposite of this is a hydrolysis reaction. 
Hydro refers to water. And you may remember from biology, I don't know if you remember this, but to lice, when a cell lyses, it means it explodes or it breaks. Like in a hypertonic, hypotonic solution, you learn about how the cell swells up and if the, if the cell keeps swelling, it would explode. And that's called lysis. So hydrolysis would mean the breaking using water. So it's the opposite. So for example, your body has to build proteins. Your muscles made out of protein. You take amino acids, and your body uses protein synthesis, and it takes the amino acids and uses these dehydration synthesis reactions to make a big long chain. And those big long chains become your enzymes, uh, the hemoglobin of your blood, you know, your muscle, <coughs> all the different kinds of proteins that were used in our body. But on the flip side, let's say you eat a steak. Well, the steak doesn't just turn into muscle. You have to digest it. So you're doing the opposite. The enzymes in your stomach and in your intestines are doing hydrolysis reactions. They're taking a protein, or a complex carbohydrate or whatever it is, and they're breaking it into pieces. So these two reactions, the condensation and the hydrolysis, are opposites of each other, and they are basically the two reactions that build and break down all the organic compounds that we're going to be talking about. Okay. Here's a diagram. This is the one that's in your notes. And like I said, if you drew this one in the lab, that's fine. It's not necessary, it doesn't have to be this drawing. Because the important part of what's going on is not this. The important part of what's going on is that you have two things and that the OH on one of them and the H on the other are gonna hook together and leave. That's the important part of the reaction. So whether you drew this complicated one or whether in the lab you just draw a circle and an OH and a circle and an OH and show a little dotted line around that, you've still represented the same thing, just so you know. That's the important part of the reaction. Okay, so isomers. Probably never learned about these. I think even in chemistry, I don't know if you talk much about it. In AP even, I don't know if you ever talk about isomers. Um, basically, the thing is, organic compounds, a lot of them, have the same exact formula, but then when you draw them, you can draw them in more than one way. If I gave everybody, I don't know if you ever played with the little molecular uh, model units with the little balls of oxygen and hydrogen and, and you build stuff with it. Um, I could give everybody six carbons and 12 hydrogens and six oxygens and say, build me something. And I would probably get, you know, there's only certain ways you can do it. Like hydrogen can only connect to one thing. So hydrogens would have to be on the ends somewhere. But the bottom line is you might come up with a whole bunch of different ways to put those together. Those are called isomers. The reason it's important is that the way that they are arranged in space three-dimensionally changes the way they react in your body. And um, so here's, here's a very good example. Well, this is not a very good example. This is just two isomers. It's hard to really see how they're isomers of each other, but basically they're three-dimensionally, they're arranged differently. But here's a practical application of it. Um, Back in, I want to say the 60s, there was a drug called thalidomide. And thalidomide was used in pregnant women. It was used to control morning sickness. You know, you get all nauseous and they would throw up and everything. And thalidomide sort of was a, um, uh, it had a calming effect and it stopped the vomiting or whatever. So it became widely prescribed. What they didn't realize at the time was that thalidomide has two isomers that are mirror images of each other. They look almost the same, but it's sort of like trying to put your left shoe on your right foot. It doesn't quite fit right. And it turns out that the body breaks down the one form of thalidomide and uses it as a sedative, but the other form of thalidomide caused this. It caused mutations in the developing children. And so there was this widespread um, number of children across the nation that were born with this same genetic or de developmental defect with these very, very short arms. In fact, it was so common that if you know that Billy Joel song, We Didn't Start the Fire, there's a line in that song that says children of thalidomide. I mean, it was enough of a big deal that when he's talking about Eisenhower and all these different things, he mentions this. Obviously, they don't prescribe it anymore. Um, but that's a good example of a practical application of isomers. Not every isomer is going to behave the same. Just because it has the same formula doesn't mean it's arranged the same way and doesn't mean your body will use it the same way. So the first one that we're going to talk about today is carbohydrates. The building blocks of carbohydrates are going to be your monosaccharides. This is from the lab. If you worked on the pre-lab, you'll know that carbohydrate is basically, the meaning of it is carbon water. And if you look at the formula, that makes sense. Because basically the formula for a carbohydrate 
is just a carbon and a water. What's the end represent? Somebody told me normal. I, I had all kinds of nitrogen. No, it's not nitrogen either. It's a variable. For example, in glucose, n is equal to 6. That means our formula would be for glucose C6, H12, 6 times 2, O6. Now, in ribose, like RNA, DNA, RNA, ribose, it turns out that N is 5. So the formula from ribose would be C5, H, H10, O5. So this is just basically what they're saying is even complex carbohydrates are basically just a multiple of this. I don't know if you remember in chemistry learning empirical formulas and molecular formulas. This is basically the general empirical formula for every carbohydrate. They all consist of this ratio, kind of a one to two to one ratio. And then um, the actual formula will be a multiple of that. As you see real complex ones, the ratio kind of goes off a little bit, but it's still going to generally look like this. A lipid, on the other hand, is also made of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, but a formula for a lipid would be something like, um, let's say, C24H48O3. It's hardly any oxygens and all carbons and hydrogens. But if you saw C24H48O23, um, that would be a carbohydrate. Even though it's off by one, it's generally a one to two to one ratio. So that's what you're looking for in carbohydrates. And you'll see when we talk about lipids, that's the last one we're going to talk about today. Um, OK, so our building blocks are monosaccharides, which are single sugars. When we build a bunch of them, we get um, polysaccharides, which are complex sugars. Glucose is probably the most common monosaccharide. Everybody's heard of glucose, I hope. Um, it's the one that's floating through your blood. It's the one your cells are using for energy on a general basis. Um, your blood glucose levels pretty much stay the same. They, you maintain a homeostasis. When you eat more food and you make more glucose, you take it away and store it. But then when you haven't eaten in a while, you bring out more glucose, and then your cells have it to use, or when you're exercising or whatever. The, the main job of monosaccharides, they're used for energy. Ribose and deoxyribose, I just mentioned, five carbon sugars. They're part of DNA and RNA. A <coughs> couple of disaccharides that are common, sucrose, which is like table sugar, the kind that you use for baking or the kind that you might put in um, like coffee. That's sucrose, it's a disaccharide. And lactose is another disaccharide. Now here's another example of isomers. Sucrose and lactose are pretty much isomers of each other. They have the same general formula, but I've never heard of somebody who couldn't eat sucrose. <coughs> Pretty much everybody can eat sugar, sucrose sugar. I have heard of people that can't eat lactose, though, because lactose is arranged differently. And some people, in fact, a lot of people, um, don't have the proper enzyme. It's, it doesn't function well or it doesn't function at all, and they're lactose intolerant. So when they eat lactose, they get nauseous, or they get an upset stomach, or they get diarrhea, because they don't have the proper enzyme to break down lactose. But yet they can break down sucrose, which has the same formula. So this would be a, another example of, of where um, isomers have a different, sh different structure, even though their formula is the same. Um, I'm going to show you a diagram on the next page, and I'll probably later give you a, a handout that's just got sample diagrams of everything. So don't worry about if you're trying to scribble down what everything looks like. Um, this is some pictures of monosaccharides. They can sometimes be drawn like this, like as a hexagon or a pentagon, or they can sometimes be drawn in a straight line. Um, here's the dehydration synthesis reaction. This would actually be sucrose being formed from glucose and fructose. But it's just showing you the building blocks, the monomers, and then in that case, a dimer. Polysaccharides, multiple sugars. Plants store their energy as starch. So when you think of things that are starchy, foods that are starchy, it's typically all stuff that comes from plants. Potatoes, rice, wheat, oats, corn. Um, these are basically ways that plants store their food, and then we can take the starch from those things, and we can then manufacture products that we want to have. So that's starch. When I ask how people, how animals store their energy, the most common answer I get is fat. But that, and that's true, we do store energy as fat for long term. Like if you eat way too much all the time, you're going to store your energy as fat. But what keeps you, what keeps your blood sugar stable between breakfast and lunch? or between when you went to sleep last night and when you got up this morning, is what's called glycogen. Glycogen is the main way you store energy you store it in your liver. It's sort of like having a nice little IV drip so that as you go throughout your day 
It just keeps slowly releasing sugar as you need it. You eat, now you eat a meal, it picks up the sugar and holds on to it. And so glycogen, um, there's a hormone that breaks it down. Well, insulin's one of them, and there's another one called glucagon. But you basically can release or store up glycogen. Now, if you want to lose weight, burning glycogen isn't the way to go. You're going to cut your calories and exercise so that you go past the glycogen, you use that up, and now you're going to go to fat as your next, as your next way of, um, of getting energy. Cellulose and chitin, do you remember chitin? We were talking about chitin, and I told you it was chitin. Um, those are actually structural carbohydrates. As a matter of fact, another good example of an isomer. You can digest starch, you can digest glycogen. You can't digest cellulose. If you don't believe me, then when you're done floating paper clips and pricking your finger to check your blood and doing belly flops to see if it really hurts, you can then eat some corn, which is covered, all the little kernels are covered in cellulose, but don't chew it. Just swallow it and then wait a few days and you will see that you cannot digest cellulose because that corn will come out looking just the same way that it went in. So don't do that. Oh, you could wash it off and then you'd have corn again. I mean, it's just the gift that keeps on giving. <laughs> I'm kidding. I know, that was too much, too far, a little too much. All right, and you don't have to know peptidoglycan, but that's yet another different carbohydrate that's used in, um, in bacteria. So these are just different forms. These are polysaccharides. You have your monosaccharides, which are your simple sugars, disaccharides, where you put two together, and then polysaccharides, where you have a whole bunch of them put together. So I wanted to go back because my this is where my other class stopped or where it cut off. So, all right. So lipids, long chains of hydrocarbons. Again, that's a long chain of just hydrogen and carbon, and water does not mix with that because it's perfectly stable covalent. Remember, water only dissolves things that are either polar covalent or what? Ionic. Ionic. All right. So what I said was it's a high energy storage molecule, which is a good thing. Usually you think of oh, but things that are high in fat are high in calories. That's true. But what technically a calorie is is it's the measure of the amount of energy that food can give you. So if you um, want to store energy, storing it as fat is the best way to do it because you can store double the energy in half the space. So if you think about the fat on your body, you would be twice the size you are if you had to store the energy as starch instead. Be, we'd all look like big baked potatoes. <laughs> so we can store a lot of energy in a small amount of space, and so that's where the lipids are important for energy storage. It allows us to be much more compact. Did you have a question? The calories are energy is not bad. Calories are not bad for you. They're not bad for you. The problem is that, well, particularly as Americans, we have a, a taste for high calorie foods, and they are energy, but it, but. Your body's not going to use all the energy. If you eat more energy than you need, your body's going to store it. That's the problem. So like when I get my extra mega large McDonald's shake that has 1,500 <laughs> calories in it, my body really doesn't need all those calories. So that's where you're going you're, you're to store it as fat. So calories are a good thing. It's just the problem is we tend to eat way more calories than we need because we like the taste of food and we've learned to make all kinds of foods that are just super high calorie. So if you eat like one thing all day and it's really unhealthy, like shakes, it's just like 15,000 or whatever, 200 calories is a bad thing. Your body more involved? Yes. So then it's not bad for you really? Yeah, it, you know, that's a good point. Here's the thing. She was saying, what if I eat the 1,500 calorie shake and I eat it in the morning and I don't eat anything else all day? Technically, I'm not eating too many calories. Technically, in fact, I would lose weight because that's less calories than I need. The problem is there's other things you need besides calories. Your body also needs calcium. Your body, although well, shakes probably have calcium, you can get away with that one. Um, but uh, but your body needs potassium and magnesium and vitamin A and vitamin C. And so when you're eating, if I ate a three pound bag of M and M's and I ate nothing else, calorie wise, I'd probably be okay. I probably would lose weight, but I'd also probably end up with scurvy and all these other diseases that are vitamin deficiency related diseases because I'm eating just carbs and nothing else. So that's the problem. But yes, losing weight wise, I, I would definitely go on the shake diet. That sounds very good. All right, fats and oils are our most common uh, lipids that everybody hears about. Um, we also call them triglycerides, tri for three, and it's three fatty acids. And here's a little diagram of what triglycerides look like. Whoops, let me bring that back. 
I don't know how well you can see that. Again, the TV was better than this. But so this is uh, this is triglycerides. Here's your long chain. Oops, hold on. This is here we go. Here's your long chain of fatty acids. Here's a second long chain of fatty acid and a third long chain of fatty acid. And then this little three carbon thing, this is the glycerol. And so that's why it's a triglyceride, three fatty acid chains and a glycerol. Um, this one down here, you may notice, is all bent. It's not because they ran out of space, you know, like when you run out of space for your notes, so you turn to the side and you scribble. That's not why that's bent. It's bent on purpose. Um, so I'll show you on the next slide why that is. But I don't want to go too fast. Everybody got that? Triglycerides, three fatty acids, and a glycerol. Yeah. All right, perfecto. So here's a diagram to show you the difference, or this is going to explain the difference. What does it mean if I have a sponge and I tell you the sponge is saturated with water? It means it's like as full as it can possibly be, like it can't hold another drop. Well, lipids can either be saturated or unsaturated. And the book usually gives the explanation that saturated have single bonds and that unsaturated have some double bonds. But that doesn't really explain to you why they're called saturated. The reason they're called saturated is because this would be a saturated fat. It would be a long chain of carbons like this. And it would be saturated with hydrogens. In other words, every carbon would have as many hydrogens as it could possibly hold in the carbon chain. So this right here would be an example of a saturated fatty acid. Now it would be called a fatty acid because at the very end, and don't confuse this, this is a double bond, but this is not part of the chain. This is the acid part of a fatty acid where it would connect to make a triglyceride. So every single bond, there's a single bond. What it really means though, by saturated is, this is holding as many hydrogens as it can possibly hold. It's saturated with hydrogens. And so that is a saturated fat. And it turns out, and I'm gonna explain why in a second, that saturated fats are typically solids at room temperature. So when you think of like if you cook bacon and then you leave the pan there and the, the like lard gets all nasty, and it, it, that's uh, basically a saturated fat. Plants generally make only unsaturated fats. Plants don't make saturated fats. Um, animals do, um, like um, the, the butter. Butter's saturated, but oil is unsaturated. Um, butter comes from cow's milk, an animal product. Oils tend to be corn oil, olive oil, peanut oil. Yes. What about like Crisco, like Chardonnay? Oh boy. That That's a good vegetable. question. Actually, I want to explain that. Because doesn't that have vegetable oil? So actually, going back to Crisco and also margarine. Here's the thing. Crisco is actually made out of vegetable oil. So you're like, well, how do they get it to be solid? What they do is they actually put it through a process called hydrogenation. Literally, they take it because it doesn't, it, it um, normally is unsaturated. In fact, so let me show you a picture here showing the difference. So here's your, here's your saturated on the top and unsaturated. So here's an unsaturated oil. Let's say this is, this is corn oil. And what they do is they put it through a machine that literally pumps a bunch of hydrogens in. And it kind of semi-saturates it. And now, because it's semi-saturated, it can actually start to form a solid. Now, the problem is, and this is what they didn't discover until very recently, is that they said, okay, you know what we're going to do? We're going to make partially hydrogenated vegetable oil. That's what they call it, partially hydrogenated vegetable oil. So it's vegetable oil, but they pump these hydrogens in to sort of turn it into a saturated fat, but not completely, so that it would still be better for you. What they didn't know is, when they pump the hydrogens in, it got a different shape called a trans fat. I don't know if you've ever seen on Stuff All today, they all say no trans fats. People made trans fats, they're not natural. It came from people taking unsaturated fats and saying, you know what, we're gonna, instead of giving you lard, we're gonna make Crisco, we're gonna take this, which is better for you, we're gonna pump hydrogen in and turn it into a solid, so it's sort of fake fat, but it still will be better, better for you. It turned out they made something that was worse for you because they actually, when they pumped the hydrogens in, changed its shape so that it was even worse than a saturated fat. Just another example of, of what we don't know. So today, we've obviously, we've come up with methods of doing this so that we don't make trans fats. And, um, but that's the difference. Now, why are unsaturated liquids? And why are they better for you? Why do they stay liquids in your system? Well, it's because of these, these little bins. Like, we call them kinks. Think of unsaturated fats or kinky. 
Because what's happening is, I know, that's an easy way to remember it. The boys will remember it. All right. So let's say these are saturated fats. They're nice and straight. So what happens is, as the temperature goes down to room temperature, since these are all nice and straight, they can, they can stack and congeal into a solid really easily. Now, when you think of an unsaturated fat, everywhere there's a double bond, and some of them have lots of double bonds, they're kinky. Like if I take this and I crumple it, which I really don't want to do, because my seating chart. But if I take a bunch of crumpled ones and I stack them, they're not going to flatten out and congeal really easily. You're going to have to drop the temperature much, much lower to make that turn into a solid. So unsaturated fats are liquids at room temperature. They stay liquids in your body. A lot of them have special jobs that help you, like you hear about um, like omega-3 fatty acids now. There's specific oils that have specific jobs that help you. So saturated fats are more likely to get stuck in your blood vessels and form plaques and lead to heart disease and things like that because they can form solids so easily. The kinks in this actually keep them moving and make them better for you. So does that make sense, the difference? The last, the last slide. Actually, you know what? I'm going to stop there because I promised you you'd have time to work. So you can thank my son for slowing us down. So, yes. Okay. So proteins can be looked at in levels. If we get really, really close, the bottom line, the very first level of structure that we would see is called the primary structure. So this would be like looking at us on the chemical level. The primary structure is the order of the amino acids. Now, I don't know if you remember, but every amino acid is identical except for one thing. You remember what the one difference is? The R group. The R group, good. So on one side, we have this, which is called, does anybody remember? What's the first part of the name of this? Amino. Amino. So this is our amino group. And on this side, Correct, we have the acid, which is actually a carboxyl or carboxylic acid, and that's where our amino acid comes from. And then we have a hydrogen, and then this is our R group here. So that's the one thing that differs. So if we were to, going to describe a protein on the primary level, we might say this particular protein is 120 amino acids long. And the amino acids are in this order, leucine, glycine, valine, blah, 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 they have names. In this diagram, instead of showing the letter R, they're actually showing you some of the R groups. So if we look here, here's an R group, here's an R group, an R group, an R group. And so it looks a lot more complicated, but all they're really doing is they're repra replacing the letter R with what really goes there. And that's what's going to determine what that particular amino acid is. Now, the order of amino acids is going to determine everything else about how that protein behaves. Remember, DNA codes for making these proteins. So the DNA, at some point, coded to put these amino acids in this order on this particular protein. Yes? Oh, well, I know that one of them is always a hydrogen. So if I eliminate the hydrogen here, here's the hydrogen, the hydrogen, the hydrogen. The other one has to be the R group. So you always have your amino carboxyl. Huh? On the carbon? On the, on the center carbon. Now, the other thing is about this, um, if you were looking at a drawing like this that was so complicated and you don't see the letter R, one way you can recognize that it's a protein chain is look for the repeating NCC structure. Here's your NCC. That would be one amino acid. NCC, here's a second amino acid. So you can, you can ignore the complex stuff sticking off of it if you see that backbone because that doesn't change. No matter what amino acid is, you're still going to have that repeating structure. Wait, NCC is just one, right? NCC would be one, right. And remember, what happened here is here's our, here's the one on this end. Here's our NCC. And then here's our second one, our NCC. Can I see Maria uh, Bastera? Yeah, Maggie. Now you'll be recorded for posterity in my recording. All right, and then here we have our amino group. So here's what happened. In order to connect them in this peptide bond, this connected with this, and they left. What did they make? They made water. And what do we call that reaction that put them together? A synthesis. It's, some, it's actually called, remember, what, what happens when you lose water? Dehydrated. You get dehydrated, so it's dehydration synthesis. Okay, so that's our primary structure. Now we're going to go to the next level. If we were to back up, 
we would see that in sections of this chain, there would be folding. And there's two main kinds of folding that we see. One of them is called an alpha helix, which looks like this. It's kind of a, an actual helix. Sometimes it's written with the Greek letter alpha, just so you know. If you see that funny looking fish helix, that's alpha helix. And the other pattern that we sometimes see is called a pleated sheet, or sometimes it's actually called a, a beta pleated sheet. Now, these patterns come from the reactions of the hydrogen on one amino acid with the oxygen on another. So here's our nitrogen, the amino group on one, and here's the carboxylic acid group on another. And because they're attracted to each other, we now get these patterns. So this is basically taking a step back and saying, because of the amino acid order, we're now seeing a folding pattern. The alpha helix is pretty easy to visualize. Most of you know what a helix is, sort of like taking, taking hair and making like a curly cue. The pleated sheet's a little harder to visualize, but imagine that because of attractions between the, this chain and this chain, it causes them to kind of fold up. This is what they mean by accordion style, that they're attracted, that this one is attracted to this one. So this would be one protein. This would just be a section of the protein where they were attracted to each other. So that's called secondary structure. The attractions of hydrogen bonds basically between the amino group of one and the carboxyl group of another. All right, if we were to back up even further, we would see that this entire protein folds up into what looks like a glob, but it's not. It's a specific shape. And that's called tertiary structure. It's how the entire protein folds up into a final shape. And that shape comes from disulfide bridges. Basically, this is R groups reacting with each other. You're actually getting ionic bonds between them. You're actually getting uh, what are called disulfide bridges. If you go back to functional groups, and I'm sure you all are learning, uh, disulfide bridges are reactions between one sulfhydryl or thiol group um, with another one, and they form a bridge. So here's a protein, and this is the whole chain, and it's folding up into a particular shape. Like I said, it looks like a blob. It looks like it doesn't really have any rhyme or reason, but it does. Um, I don't know if anybody remembers learning about enzymes, and when you learned about enzymes, is that they speed up reactions, and they were kind of drawn probably like this, and that was the enzyme, and this was the substrate, and the enzyme had this area called the active site. Does that sound familiar at all? Yes. Yes, to some of you? Okay. And I drew it looking like Pac-Man when I talked about yes. But the fact of the matter is an enzyme doesn't look like Pac-Man. We draw it that way to make it more easy to visualize what an enzyme looks like. This is what an enzyme would really look like. And that active site would really be a crevice like this created because of the way this folded up. This would actually be what an active site would really look like. But it's much more complex and, and crazy looking to draw all this out. So once we're on the level of talking about enzymes, we simplify it. Just like when we were talking about the cell membrane, we don't draw out the phospholipid. We just represent it with a little circle and two sticks to simplify. Well, they're actually like this because they're unsaturated. So, all right, so that's tertiary structure. The last level, if we were to back all the way up, some proteins, not all of them, some proteins only go up to tertiary, but sometimes the final functional protein is actually um, consisting of more than one chain. And that's called quaternary structure. That's just the biggest structure. So for example, this is hemoglobin on the left. You can see it better on the TV. Um, but if you look at hemoglobin, the final functioning hemoglobin is actually composed of four separate chains. So here's one, there's two, here's the third one, and a fourth one here. So the final functioning hemoglobin is actually made out of four chains, which all have primary, secondary, tertiary, and then they combine into the final structure, and that's what hemoglobin looks like. Uh, this one here, and you don't have to know these in particular, this one here is, is um, how insulin is stored. It's stored as a hexamer. How many do you think are in it? Six. Six, hexa is six. So in this case, this storage protein consists of six different chains, all combined. And this one I found, I thought it was kind of interesting. This is HIV protease. This is a particular enzyme that HIV needs in order to make copies of itself when it infects you. 
So one of the ways that um, HIV drugs work, to or you know, anti-HIV drugs, I should say, you don't want to take drugs to get HIV, <laughs> um, is that it inhibits this enzyme so that the HIV can't make copies of itself. And so basically you've shut the virus down um, by targeting a specific protein enzyme. Do you have that um, um, enzyme in you, or does it come No, what happens is the, the virus, when it infects you, it injects, in this case it's RNA, but basically it's nucleic acid. Your body follows the instructions, so then your cell reads that nucleic acid and manufactures the enzyme. So by inhibiting that, the function of that enzyme, it's not an enzyme you would normally be using, it's an enzyme that, that only is needed to build more viruses, so we can inhibit that enzyme. All right, and this last slide is just showing you, hopefully, kind of a summary of the whole thing. So if we were to go in with a microscope and look at the closest, most simple level, this would be our primary structure. Here they just wrote out the names of the amino acids. Depending on the R groups of this amino, these, these amino acids, it's gonna determine how this thing is gonna fold up. The first thing that's gonna happen is little areas are gonna form repeating patterns, and that's our secondary structure here. In this one, it's an alpha helix in this little area. There might be a pleated sheet. Oops, I didn't mean to do that. There might be a pleated sheet um, in another area over here. This could have a pleated sheet. And then um, this is tertiary, so now this is the whole thing. And then in this particular case, they're showing quaternary because they're showing that this final protein actually consists of four. All right, so now that probably made a little bit of sense, but,